you can't say we don't try and handle big topics on this channel. I've been asked by viewers what my views on mon modern monetary theory are. So I'm going to give two or three videos on the topic of what is money. So I'm going to start off by talking of the relationship between money and empire. First, I'm going to take a quote from Adam Smith and use this as the basis of what I discuss later. He said that money is the power to command the labour of others. The power to command labour. If you have money, you can command a plumber to fix your bath taps. If a firm has money, it can command employees to do whatever work it dictates. If a monarch has money, they can command armies. So in these cases, the power of command is clear. The great strength of approaching it the way Adam Smith does is it draws attention to the fact that money is a social relation a relation between people. It points out it's a power relation, one of domination and being dominated. These are things that get hidden in a standard first year conventional economics course, where money will be described in terms like it's a medium of exchange or a store of value. But those stay at the level of what Marx called fetishism. They don't penetrate behind the scenes to the actual social relationship which exists, which is the command over labour. There are other ways of commanding, of course. Let's take a quote from the Bible. For I also... I am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. So there's direct ordering about. There's direct ordering about by military officers. Or more generally, officers of the state. If you're going to have the power to order people about, if one person is going to be in command and others are to be commanded, society must mark them out in some way. They mustn't have an emblem of authority, whether it is the, the crest of a centurion or the mark of the King's Commission on an officer. The state issues them in both cases, both historical cases, with a mark of authority. We can see here the British Prime Minister boldly displaying his emblem of authority, even though his is just a delegated authority. But it's the same effigy, the same image on the coins we use. When a British subject uses pounds to pay for commodities, they command the labour of those that made those commodities. And they command it using a delegated royal power, symbolised by the fact that the coins have the royal image on them. But how does this operate? How does it work? How does the Queen have this power? And how can this power be delegated? It's not new. There's another Bible quote which relates directly to this, making the same point. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, 
Jesus is reputed to have said, showing the image of Caesar on the coin. Now, what was the context of this? The New Testament, of course, is full of Roman imperialist propaganda. In the story of the centurion I mentioned earlier, we are told that this imperialist oppressor has more faith than all the Jews. The next paragraph said, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith not in Israel. So, here is propaganda to say that the, the Jews are even less faithful to their own God than the Germans than the Romans, the Roman oppressors. And here it tells the Jews to pay their taxes to the empire. But this paying of the taxes to the empire was a paying of the taxes in the coin of the empire, giving to Caesar that which is Caesar's, giving to Caesar that which has his mark. Now, 2,000 years later, same thing was going on. Here we see Elizabeth reviewing her African soldiers and at the same time coins issued with the authority of the British Crown circulated in Africa and taxes were paid in these coins. How did this happen? Go back to 1900 the chocolate market in Britain was booming. But for all the milky images portrayed in the advertising, it depended on cocoa beans. And cocoa beans certainly didn't grow in England for all the pictures of traditional milkmaids. Cocoa beans would grow in West Africa. They're not native to West Africa, they're native to the Americas, but West Africa had the climate which would allow them to grow. If only the West Africans could be persuaded to grow them, then Cadbury's would have their beans and the Cadbury's would able, be able to make drinking chocolate, would be able to make chocolate bars. Well, conquest. The the motto of the day was, we have the maxim and they have not. Here we see the king's own African rifles, armed with the newly invented maxim machine gun and repeating rifles over their shoulders. The king paid Africans to carry out the conquest of West Africa for him. The king soon had his colony with the inhabitants working hard to harvest cocoa and palm nuts. And within a couple of years was issuing postage stamps to mark this fact. Here, we sh here he shows an African harvesting cocoa beans for him and here a rather fanciful image of a Yoruba woman producing oil palm uh, nuts. Not actually a traditional Yoruba dress, but the fantasy that they, the British imperialists had. And how was this done? How was Edward and later Elizabeth able to force the Africans to work growing crops for British chocolate firms? Here, here's a much later stamp, same thing going on. They're quite blatant about what the purpose of the colony was. How did they do it? They did it by taxing. Made the West Africans pay taxes in British West Africa colonial coin. And the only way they could get the coin, or the main way they could get the coin, was by selling the crops to British cocoa companies. This forced a subsistence economy to become a commodity producing one, become a commodity producing, commo sorry, a, an economy which produced cash crops. The importance of this illustration, or this episode, is that it illustrates how, in a very short period, 
commodity money relations can be imposed on a society. And it reveals the mechanism by which commodity money relations were imposed and thereby the hidden mechanism which has been operating much longer in the rest of the world by which commodity money relations came into existence and are sustained. The point is that these coins were largely worthless. They were just copper tokens. There's no pretense of a gold standard. The British state didn't need these coins when it taxed the Africans. It wasn't actually gathering any wealth with these coins. They were just an indirect way of forcing surplus labour to be performed. There was a symbolic appropriation of the surplus when the state collected in these coins. But there were these were coins that the colonial administration had issued in the first place. And in doing this, the British Empire was explicitly copying earlier empires. It was copying the monetary processes, practice of older empires. These had token coins whose circulation was forced by the need to pay imperial taxes. And even the physical form of copper token coinage with a hole in the middle was copied by the British from the Chinese Empire. So what was the circuit of money in the, in the colony, time of King Edward? Let's look at the internal circulation. I said that the empire maintained control of its colonies by African soldiers which it recruited and paid. It paid these soldiers in the coin it issued. With these coins they could purchase food from the farmers, shown as yams here. And the force of arms, of the soldiers, of the police, of the administrators, then compelled the farming population to pay taxes in these coins. Because they had to pay the taxes, they were willing to accept the coins in exchange for food, in exchange with feeding the soldiers, and more generally, in exchange for supporting the government and colonial government administration that was paid out of these coins. But that's just the internal colonial market. What's happening here is that the king is commanding the payment of money taxes at gunpoint. When a soldier that he pays uses these money tokens to command the labour of farmers to feed him, the soldier is taking a delegated power of the state. But here is the paradox. It is the soldier himself who is enforcing the power of the state. The whole system, from the standpoint of the king, is self-sustaining. He taxes the farmers in coin, he issues the coin, taxes it back, he uses the coin to pay his soldiers and the soldiers enforce the taxes. But I've shown a large coin here and a smaller coin here. The king doesn't spend all the tax employing soldiers. Instead, another portion of the reven royal revenue is spent with British firms purchasing from them, for example, gunships to protect his colonies from other European monarchs. So some of the colonial coin ends up in the hand, or colonial notes ends up in the hands of British firms. And the British firms are then able to use it to purchase cocoa. 
So the whole system works in such a way as to extract a surplus product, a physical surplus product of the cocoa beans, which end up in the hands of the British firms. But the real social relation is the performance of labour. And this is being commanded by the coin. But the commanding of labour by the coin is only achieved by the fact that the king has an army at his command and can enforce tax collection. This is quite contrary to the account of money that you'll be taught if you do an elementary economics class, where you'll be taught that it is a convenience invented to overcome the inconvenience of barter, that it was a social convention to agree on particular weights of metal that would be used in trade. No, it's not. That's not historically how it came about. And looking at a recent event, something that happened only just over a hundred years ago, gives a clear understanding of the real mechanism by which a monetary economy comes into existence. I will cover monetary economies under other circumstances in another video.